Hi, good morning. Lori Vallow is going to be sentenced today. Uh, we're going to have our victim impact statements and, oh God, sorry. My dog just went in the back of the camera again. Uh, yeah, we're doing the Lori Vallow sentencing today. So Lori Vallow, again, has been charged with the murders of her two children, uh, JJ and Ty Lee, conspiracy to murder for Tammy Daybell, Chad Daybell's uh, wife at the time, and also for, I think it was a grand theft as well, because she was collecting the benefits, monetary benefits, that were supposed to go to JJ and Ty Lee. So um, we're going to go over to Judge Boyce's YouTube channel, and uh, this is going to be on Zoom. Audio seems pretty good. Video seems pretty good. I'm pretty happy with the quality, so let's listen to it. All right. Good morning, everyone. We're going on the record now in this good case. Morning. Let me first confirm through our uh, tech people. Is the matter being live streamed and is the feed working properly? Yep. Looks good. We get a confirmation on that. Zoom it is. Um, yeah, we're all on Zoom right now. Madam Court Reporter, are you ready? All right. Okay. And I just got a confirmation as well that the matter is being broadcast for the court's order. Is this is case CR 22211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow, Fremont County case. This is the time scheduled for sentencing today. The defendant is here appearing in person along with her attorneys, Jim Archibald and John Thomas. The state's represented by Rob Wood, Rachel Smith, and Lindsay Blake. At this time, I do want to inquire of counsel. Uh, from the state who will be making the sentencing recommendation today? I will, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wood. And for the defense, who's going to be making the sentencing recommendation? I will, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Thomas, thank you. A couple of preliminary matters before we get started with the substance of the Prepare. sentencing hearing. Court would first note there is a conduct order that's been entered in this proceeding governing this courtroom. The court is live streaming the hearing today. However, for those in attendance, there's no a uh, provision to allow any type of recording, either audio or video in this proceeding. So that's prohibited. In addition, the court uh, requires that any electronic devices be turned off or Look put in a silent mode. If any cell phones or other devices go off Just and cause any disruption during the proceedings, Lori they'll Vallow. be taken by the bailiffs in this case. And also uh, the court would note as part of the conduct order, there's a prohibition against any kind of disruptive behavior. So no outbursts or other types of uh, acts will be tolerated in this sentencing hearing. We'll maintain order as we did throughout these proceedings in this case and throughout the trial as well. So I appreciate all of the presence of our bailiffs here to enforce the order. And I would ask the compliance of all those in attendance to follow carefully those admonishments in the court's order. Another matter I'll bring up as we start for the okay? sentencing hearing uh, over last week on Friday and through the weekend, there were some motions filed. There was an objection to the pre-sentence report and a motion to strike victim impact statements. I think I saw that Lori Vallow's aunt was trying to do an impact statement. Court took up the pleadings of those and given the timing and without adequate time to respond and have a hearing, court went I through agree. the matters and issued orders on both of those motions. Uh, so I consider them resolved, but let me just confirm with counsel. Mr. Wood, did the state receive copies of the court's orders pertaining to those two motions? Yes, we did. All right. And Mr. Thomas, did the defense receive those orders as well? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, counsel. In this case, which was on April 19th, 2022. Okay, it's cranked up now. You were informed that an indictment had been filed against you by the state of Idaho, charging you with the following crimes. Two counts of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder and grand theft by deception. Two counts of first-degree murder and one count of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder and one count of grand theft. At the time of your arraignment, you were advised of the potential penalties involved with those charges, your constitutional rights, your plea options, and the legal consequences of exercising each of those options. You pled not guilty to the charges. Later during trial, an amended indictment was filed by the state. A jury trial in your case took place in Ada County, Idaho, with jury selection beginning March 27th of this year, 2023. And as I mentioned, during the trial, an amended indictment had been filed. The case was submitted to the jury for their deliberations on May 11th of this year. And on May 12th, the jury returned their verdict. Wow, time flies. Guilty of the following counts of that amended indictment. Count one. Bro, this is, this is her right now, honestly. She's like sitting like this legs crossed and she's just like she just chilling you know she's like just another day in the life of lori vallow that's all got my tv tam i'm a beautiful goddess like <laughs> this bitch over here just chilling oh conspiracy to commit first degree murder oh, of tylee ryan God. and grand theft by deception count two first degree murder of tylee ryan maybe she's count got three, some back conspiracy pain conspiracy to commit first degree murder of joshua jackson vallow and grand theft by deception count four first degree murder of joshua jackson vallow Count five, conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Tamara Tammy Daybell, and count six, grand theft. 
After you were found guilty by a jury of your peers, the sentencing hearing was scheduled. Pursuant to Idaho law, the court then ordered the preparation of a pre-sentence investigation report, which will be referred to throughout this proceeding as a PSI. You know what? She might as well just go all the way, put her head down on the table, just do the Letitia thing. <laughs> and the court's considered that report for sentencing today. The court did order a full PSI, which would include orders for a behavioral health assessment, a mental health examination, substance abuse assessment, and all pursuant to Idaho Code 1925-24. However, you chose not to participate in the pre-sentence process, so much of that information that could have been included for my consideration in the report has not been included. Mm, interesting. I've received and I have carefully reviewed the pre-sentence investigation report, and a copy of that report was provided to both the state and the defendant through her attorney. I'll ask the state at this time then, was the state able to review the PSI? Yes, we were. Mr. Wood, in that report, and I know it's a voluminous report, 430 pages, but were there any sections or parts of the report that you believe need to be clarified or corrected after your review? Just very briefly, Your Honor, um, there were multiple uh, victim impact statements submitted with that report. We don't usually comment on those, but just for purposes of the record, in one of those uh, victim impact statements, there was reference made to uh, Tammy Daybell dying by a pillow we, on the record for the purposes of the record. The state has no evidence that that happened that way. Uh, there was also reference to that we don't know where whether or not the defendant was there at Tammy Daybell's death. And just for purposes of the record, we, and as it was shown in trial, we are aware she was not at the location Tammy Daybell was murdered. She was in Hawaii. Um, again, our concern, we just wanted to be clear for purposes of the record so that an allegation could not be made down the road that the state had provided evidence or information to victims that we had not, uh, one that wasn't true or two hadn't been provided to the defense. All right, regarding those statements, then the court would uh, most likely strike those from the record based on those comments. The court would also note in ruling on uh, motions over the weekend, I further ordered stricken certain parts of victim impact statements. Uh, so what's noted from here is that it seems like the judge was able to look at the victim impact statements ahead of time. And to me, I think this is kind of important. Mr. Thomas, any objection to me striking those comments and those statements? Yeah, Mr. Archibald is going to address this portion if that's okay with the court. Very yeah, well. I was on Mr. the phone Archibald. earlier. We've reviewed the court's order striking portions of those victim impact statements. We do not object to the court ordering that those. Oh, Mr. Archibald, your mic is kind of low. Um, I'm going to boost it up a little bit. All right. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. So back to you, Mr. Wood. If, could you clarify with some specificity where those specific comments were located and the court will go through and what they would refer to as redlining. I'll, I'll line those out in the final PSI that gets submitted into the case file. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, they were contained in Ms. Hoban's uh, PSI, or I'm sorry, uh, victim impact statement. And if the court would like, I can find the page number of that. I'm at least glad, though, with the victim impact the statements. Record, if you could reference the page number, then I will go in and redline those revisions to the report before it's finalized. It is when in the, the third full paragraph on, or full, third paragraph on page two. When the statements are made, at least they are looking at the judge, because if you're making a statement and you see Lori, like, right in front of you, that would have been so distracting and extremely frustrating. The paragraph of page two. Okay, so let's to figure out where to redline. No, there isn't. All right. Let me next move to the defense then, Mr. Archibald, in regards to the PSI filed in the case, does the defense have any uh, further objection or anything you wish clarified or corrected in the report? Your Honor, uh, on June 13th, I submitted 661 pages <laughs> to the pre-sentence investigator that I believe dealt with the health of the defendant. Oh, because early the judge said that Lori Val didn't participate in the pre-sentencing investigation. And now Jim Archibald's like, well, I did send like a 600 page thing. <laughs> I wonder what happened to 660 that. 660 pages. Um, got reduced. I didn't know how many of those pages would be included in the report. Turns out uh, only 27 pages were included. 27, 27 pages. pages uh, do include Dr. Watson's uh, uh, psychological opinion and also Dr. Cunningham's. So I appreciate the pre-sentence investigator including those two reports, but I asked for additional reports regarding the health of the defendant. The court Is has better? now issued an opinion this morning uh, ruling on that, but my uh, objection to the, the pre-sentence report stands. All right, thank you, Mr. Archibald. The court would note uh, in the order issued this morning and it's entitled order on objection to the PSI, the court went through an analysis on the statutes and the rules as relating to the prior competency information and why 
I found it was inappropriate to include in the PSI as the investigator noted. And so that will be the mm. court's order at this time on those submissions. Oh, Any other competency uh, matters in the report you wish to provide? Damn, imagine submitting a 600 or something report and only like 20 pages gets <laughs> Only 20 pages go through. Corrected, Mr. Archibald. No, Your Honor. Jeez. Okay, thank you, counsel. Let me confirm with counsel then to Mr. Thomas and Mr. Archibald. Was your client able to review the report as well? Yes. Yes. All right, thank you. All right, I will note that I'll rely on that report then with those redactions in fashioning the sentence today. Moving now oh, yeah, to that's the smart question for sure. of whether there will be any witness statements or testimony here proffered today. For the defense, are you offering any statements from any witnesses today, Mr. Thomas or Mr. Archibald? No, Your Honor. Just All right. the, Ms. Vallow may, may speak. On Very well. Behalf. So the defendant, I'll address that. She'll have a right of allocution if she wishes. From the state, Mr. Wood, is the state intending to call any New poll. Uh, witnesses to testify or victims to provide oral impact statements today? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the state will not be calling any evidentiary witnesses. Uh, however, uh, there are four victims who wish to be heard. Uh, the victims, uh, well, Tyree Ryan and J.J. Vallow's brother, Colby Ryan, has asked that we read his statement into the record. Uh, so with permission of the court, I will do that on his behalf. Okay, After so he's that, not going to be uh, here. Samantha William. Honestly, though, like her oldest son, I bet you it's tough. Like I, I probably wouldn't even want to be there myself. Like having to be there, read the victim impact statement about your siblings and your mom just sits there like nonchalantly, arms crossed, you know, laid back, like. That shit hurts. Tammy Daybell's sister has asked to be heard. Uh, Vicki Hogan, Tammy Daybell's aunt, has asked to be heard. And Kay Woodcock, J.J. Vallow's uh, grandmother, has asked to be heard. She has a chance to speak. Very well. Do you the court think she's has uh, speak? previously determined that these are either victims or designated representatives under Idaho statute to be able to provide statements in this case, given the murder convictions. So the court will uh, allow for them to make their comments today. Let me just. Uh, indicate then how the hearing will proceed going forward. So first, the court will consider those victim impact statements that may be read into the record or offered by those individuals. After that, I intend to hear the recommendations on sentencing from you, Mr. Wood. Once the state's concluded, then making its recommendations. It's like she's at the Mr. bar. Thomas, you may make recommendations on behalf of your client, Ms. Vallow. And then finally, Ms. Vallow, if you wish to address the court directly, you can do that after your attorney has done so. It's like a child so at like with detention. That in mind, Mr. Wood, uh, I'll start by going through the victim impact statements the state intends to introduce, and you can either read into the record or call your uh, first victim to make a comment at this time. One more point of clarification, sorry. The victims, if they do wish to speak, uh, will speak at the podium over to my left. And I'll note that that is not being filmed uh, for this proceeding, so it won't be shown on the video. Uh, that's how the courts arranged the courtroom, just so counsel knows. So Mr. Wood, if you'd like to uh, either read a comment or have your first victim speak, you can do that now. Thank you. Before I do that, Your Honor, I, I did neglect to say that Samantha William will also be uh, reading into the record uh, the statement of her father, which was included in the PSI, if the court permits. All right. The court will so permit that on your request. And, and with that, then we would we would uh, ask that Samantha be allowed to make her statement now. Very well. Um, yeah, William, it kind of looks like, like she's wearing a onesie. And you can provide your statement type of thing, right? Turn, uh, right in front of you. The shoes, the socks, like blends with her like jail suit. Please state your name for the record as you begin. <clears throat> My name is Samantha William. Uh, do you want me to do my father's after mine or do it before mine? It's up to you. I'm going to read his first. Uh, this is what my father wrote. His name is Ronald Douglas. He is writing on behalf of myself and my now deceased wife. I would like to share thoughts about the impact of the actions of Lori Vallow on my, our family. Tammy's death with, was unexpected and had a proud, profound impact on all of us. We were barely into our recovery process when we learned of Chad's new marriage exactly two weeks after losing Tammy. We had no knowledge of missing children until we were listening. visited by law enforcement officers and informed of Tammy's disinterment and autopsy. The drama began to unfold and the reason for the quick burial became apparent. Over the course of the following months, the ensuing revelations of deceit and intrigue caused extreme emotional stress on my wife, Phyllis. We became estranged from the Daybell children and began losing the close relationships we had with them. I'm sure they feel awkward about their father's actions and how Tammy's death was affecting us. We value them as grandchildren and want to keep them close to us. While Phyllis was already battling her leukemia of over 30 years, the emotional stress of this drama seemed to accelerate her declining health. Her remaining months of life were full of strain and heartache. Lori entered Chad's life long before we were aware of any interaction between them. In retrospect, we see that Chad was living a double life and the bonds of his family were being eroded due to his involvement with Lori. The eternal ramifications of her actions are yet to be calculated. 
Lori needs to pay for her actions according to the laws of mortals. She will still answer according to the laws of God when she passes from this life. Ron Douglas. Can't wait for Chad. This is my trial. statement. Can't wait. Over the last few years, I have often thought about what I would ever say to you, Lori. I've often thought about what my sister would have said too. The minute I found out that Chad had quickly remarried after the death of my most beloved sister, Tammy, it confirmed what I had always felt. You see, the minute I received the phone call that she had died, I knew something had happened to her, but I didn't know why I would feel that way. So when we were told by Chad that he had married you and that it had happened two weeks after Tammy had been buried. He told them? Oh my God, he told them himself? Jesus. Ah, Shiro, you're messing up my camera. My heart knew. <laughs> I researched you like any true woman would to find out who you were. What did I find? Lies. Everything about you that you tried to tell others is a lie. You know, at this point, I'm going to object. I don't believe this falls within the statute or within uh, the Idaho Constitution or within Idaho uh, versus Payne. All right, Mr. Thomas, your objection is noted. It's overruled. The court will be able to consider and ferret out these statements and properly consider what's in the record. You can continue. Thank Ms. you. William. Again, this is not the jury that's considering this. It's the judge. We asked, what's her name? Lori Ryan. Well, that was a lie. That was two husbands ago. So as we, I searched, what happened to your previous husband? We, she told us that he died from a heart attack. Mm. Lie. Charles. Died from being shot. I asked, are there children? I was told we will be empty nesters. That's a lie. She said empty nesters. The police ask us about missing children. You answer, the children aren't missing. They're safe and happy. It's mm. a lie. Your children, your poor children were dead and buried on Chad's property. And my sister was told was sick and her health was failing. Well, that was a lie. I had seen her with my own eyes two weeks prior. She was very healthy. We have to go through her being disinterred and having an autopsy done. Was glad to get some answers and some truth after so many lies. But to find out what we knew in our hearts all along, she had been murdered by those who saw her as an obstacle to a plan. You planned her murder just as much as you planned the murders of your own children and your previous husband. Why? Why plan something so heinous? You had an affair with a married man. You lied to yourself I was okay to sneak behind the backs of your spouses. You are not exalted beings, and Good. your behavior oh, yeah. makes you ineligible to be one. Good. But why pick Chad? He was an average guy, and you had married several men before him. He made you feel special and singled out. You tell yourself that you were high spiritual beings who have lived lives together through time. You felt powerful. This is too is a lie. But Chad has no real wealth. How will you live? You can easily have divorced your spouses and made your own perverted life together, but you need money. So you tell this story about people being dark and that they are zombies. This is how you justify who needs to be removed. You use this lie to justify the murders of four people whose deaths you profit from. But you get there and think, you've never met me and I don't know you. But I've always been able to tell when I am being lied to and you are a liar, an adulteress and a murderer. Because of the choices you made, my family lost a beloved mother, sister, aunt, and daughter. She is irreplaceable. She was 1,000 times the woman you will ever dream of being. Because of the choices you made, we have been hounded by media and those who revel in all of the salacious scandal you have stirred up. Because of you and your desire to get what you want at any cost, my family has been ripped apart. I helped raise Tammy's children. And because of you, they no longer have their mother or grandmother. And because of fear of losing another parent, they listen to the lies spewed by you and Chad. Oh, dude. So I wonder if the children are still kind of like on team Chad's side right now. Our relationship is strained and most contact with them is gone. Sounds like it. Your trial was the last thing my ailing mother had to live through. She declined in health as she heard through news reports all the horrible things that happened and she had to relive all the things we have tried to forget the last four years. My mother passed away in June knowing that you will never come out of prison again. Her passing was marred by the fact that Tammy's children chose not to participate in her funeral because of fear of causing more drama. What? We were deprived of the chance to heal and have them realize how much we love them. We don't blame them for what happened, but we blame you and Chad for all the lies you've told and ripping apart this family. We didn't do anything. My parents are not evil. They did not deserve to lose their grandchildren on top of losing their daughter. I did not deserve to lose the relationships of children I helped raise or a sister that was my dearest friend. I am not a dark person or a zombie. And for, for me and my family to be portrayed that way is unacceptable. Lucky for me, the world can see the truth as much as I can. Everyone now knows what liars you are. They now all know what horrible things you have done. You will have to live in your prison cell for the rest of your life. You are not an exalted being and there's no huge event that is going to save you. 
Mm. No jail walls are going to fall so you can leave. No angels are coming to rescue you. You made judgments of others and determined that they should die based on the fact that they might do bad things and we need to kill them before they do. That is not how the atonement works. We cannot punish and judge others on things they haven't happened yet, but you did. You have also made choices that have led you here. You have been judged by the court and you have been found guilty. Your consequences are before you. I miss my sister every day. I will grieve her and know the loss of my mother for the rest of my life. I will always remember them. As for you, I choose to forget you. And as I leave this courtroom today, I choose to never think of you again. Thank you. All right, thank you for the impact statement, Ms. William. Mr. Wood, if you'd like to call the next victim who wishes to speak. That would be Vicki Hoban, Your Honor. Damn, that's crazy. Because like when you think about these crimes, you just think about like the immediate families and friends, right? But then you don't think about like the ripple effect. So it's so crazy how Tammy Daybell's family, it's like they don't really have any connections to Tammy's children right now because they are probably on their dad's side because they don't want to lose another parent. And yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's just really fucking sad. And then also, just to take note, this loser right here, Lori Vallow and Chad, they were mostly relying on their significant others for income. So when you have these two losers get together and none of them want to work, they're like, hey, well, what should we do? Why don't we just kill off our significant others? Why don't we just kill off the kids? Let's get money that way. Just because they probably didn't want to work. They just wanted to have it the easy way. All right, Ms. Hoban, you may it's come so forward. Offer your statement there at the lectern. Um, first, I'd like to thank the court for allowing me to um, give a statement here today. Aww. I'm Tammy Vicky. I was able to attend a big part of this trial. And so my first comment will be to address what I felt the defendant's behavior was. I felt she was shameful during the trial. It was apparent to me and others that the defendant did not take the proceedings in this courtroom seriously. It was extremely disrespectful to watch, especially during some of the most sensitive and heartbreaking testimony. Her smirking, her smiling, giggling, talking. Judge, I'm going to object based on state versus pain, based on the Idaho Constitution, based on Idaho Code. So <clears throat> this is why I wanted to bring up earlier. So the victim impact statements, it seems like the judge already got them ahead of time and already looked at them. I don't know. I can't imagine going up there. Giving a victim impact statement, it's already really hard to speak in front of the people. It's hard to speak, you know, when you know there's a live stream, even though your face is not showing. But like you're reading it, you're getting really emotional, and then you just keep getting fucking interrupted. I, uh, 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 oh, oh, I would be so frustrated. Uh, 195306, she's supposed to give an impact statement, which, uh, uh, which the defendant's criminal conduct had upon the victim. Payne states that the victim impact statement must relate to the characteristics of the victim and the emotional impact of the crime on the family. We have a brief sidebar with Mr. Thomas and Mr. Wood. All right, go to the sidebars. Don't know what she's doing there. Jim Archibald's like, get me away from here. <laughs> I feel like Jim Archibald is just so over her. <laughs> All right, they're back. on this victim impact statement. I had a brief sidebar with counsel and discussed that. I do in part grant the uh, objection and I've instructed the state to discuss that with the victim to tear up, uh, tailor her comments to those appropriate for an impact statement at this point. So Mr. Wood, I give you an opportunity to discuss that with Ms. Hoban. Ms. Hoban, if you're ready to continue, apologies for the interruption, but we wanna make sure the records follow carefully here. Thank you. type of vibe that was in the courtroom at the time it was really hurtful to us. We were unable to be in our feelings and listen to the testimony without having extreme emotion. Oh no, now she has to like, have to like live edit That's her it, speech. Right. This was a woman who had killed her own children and was on trial for doing that and for killing Tammy. And we felt that she could have had more respect for the family members in the courtroom. Tammy was a most excellent person and she led her life with the utmost dignity and was beloved not only by our family, but by the community at large. There will be a huge void 
And this is Tammy's story, and therefore it's part of our family history. This statement will not be about Lori, it will be about Tammy because it's her story. It's her life that was taken. She was a mom, a grandma, a daughter, a sister, a niece, a cousin, friend, and yes, she was a librarian. But more than a librarian, she was a teacher. She loved her job and went above and beyond for her students. Her last days filled with preparing a book fair for underserved children. I'm sure when she arrived home Friday, October 18th, 2019, she was very tired from a long day and the hours at school. As she got into bed that night, I would imagine she was thinking the same thing as every other night. Nothing more than getting a good night's sleep once her eldest had checked in from his late night job. She had no idea what the plan was for that night or what had been the plan for quite some time. Unbeknownst to her, there had been quite a bit of discussion about how to get rid of the obstacles that Lori had. Lori had already killed two of her children. Tammy was next on her list of obstacle removal. Lori wanted money, sex, and more power. And what Lori wants, Lori gets. The plan was in place on how to get it. Instead of a good night's sleep, Tammy was brutally executed in her own bed. She was taken from us by murdering thieves. Lori sits here convicted and prepped for prison. And let's be honest, the only question left is for how long? But Tammy was robbed of her entire life. And all of her family robbed of ever seeing her again. Curtis, as she's chatting with her lawyer, finding anything and everything to distract her from listening. I know she put on her glasses, acting like she got something to read in there. Never will she whisper a joke with a friend and laugh. Never see another sunrise or a sunset. Never smell fresh rain or see her grandchildren stomp through a mud puddle. Never to hear being called grandma or mom. Not another birthday, Christmas, birth of a grandchild, or graduation from preschool. No seeing pictures of prom, first dates, or weddings. No searching for something fun to do or growing a garden. Never attending one of our families just for the girls' lunches where we reconnected from all over, laughed about the good old times, and the funny way that Grandma Cooper took pictures. And then we'd take photos with each other that we would compare at the next lunch. There would never be another hilarious rendition of Patty and her singing, Do Your Ears Hang Low? She'd never wave at a friend as they passed by make dinner for a sick friend, never have a last conversation with her beautiful mother, or one last kiss goodbye. No more of her dad's dad jokes or Samantha's outdoor parties. No more lining up with all of her siblings to get the photo at the next event. A life full of people she loved and who loved her deeply. Her life was snuffed out. To say heartbreaking, gut-wrenching, unbearable is not a big enough statement to convey knowing the way this most excellent existence was taken by planning and execution. The most innocent of lives was simply just discarded like it meant nothing, but it did. And like all of Lucille's grandchildren, her life was a vibe. It was a valiant and reproached, un unreproachable life. Laura, you participated in the savage murders of precious people. You're welcome. Great value and worth. It is most likely something that you would probably never understand to be selfish and just to live life in a simple way, enjoying life for what it is, to love, to be loved, to smile, and to be smiled at. But while you had a shameful relationship with Tammy's husband and planned out a murder, Tammy lived her life. She supported her family in every way. And for you to turn her home where she lived and slept into a cemetery, two innocent and beautiful children is one of the most horrific things I can think of. Tammy would have been horrified to know what you had done and it has broken us as a family. You are now going to pay the price, albeit never sufficient in this life. It's all that we, that we can do. Dude, that's so disgusting. She said that she, Lori turned Tammy's home where she lived and slept into a cemetery. I wonder if Lori also like spent nights there too. Like how soon after did Lori move in and all that stuff? Like, I don't know. That, that's, that's so weird. I don't know if she did I or not. The life you live. And be surprised. Is filled with fear. 
and that every day you are terrified. Just the way that beautiful Tylee lived in fear for hers and sweet JJ as you continued terrifying her by saying they would be zombies. And she knew the consequences of being what you call dark. Tylee had many wonderful friends that loved her and in a cruel irony, my granddaughter was a good friend to Tylee. <laughs> this friend group can still to this day not speak of Tylee freely. They are so stuck in their grief and sadness for their friend who is savagely brutalized and murdered at her mother's hands. It's unconscionable to them and the grief is still overwhelming. In closing, I would like to thank all of the law enforcement, the FBI, the investigators, the prosecutors, the administration, everybody has worked so diligently on this case. I especially want to thank those who had to see those things that can't be unseen. We understand your pain also, and grateful for the many, many hours of hard work and dedication and the search for the truth. Uh, thank you, Judge. I trust that you will do the correct penalty for this. Thank you. All right, Ms. Hoban, thank you for your Yeah, Lori looking like a Dr. Statement. Seuss character over there. Uh, this is on Zoom call, that's Mr. why. Wood. The next uh, victim will be Kay Woodcock. All right, Ms. Woodcock. Thanks and appreciation for being able to speak publicly today on the impact of the defendant's actions. Thank you. 80, 1401, 1481, 1, 72, 1536, 0, 52, 8, 72, 319, and finally 1 million. These are more than just numbers and very important numbers and will make sense as I continue. <clears throat> 80 days ago, on May 12, 2023, the word, the word guilty was read for each of the charges in May Daybell is being sentenced for today. Guilty, the word cemented what I had known for 1,401 days, was returned by the jury. The jury devoted their time, energy, and dedication to deliver justice for J.J. Tiley and Tammy for every single heinous crime charged. Our family is eternally grateful for their sacrifice. Justice would not have been possible without the time, perseverance, and tireless work every member of multiple law enforcement agencies, prosecution team, court personnel, and the court. Our appreciation and thanks can never be expressed in a way that will ad adequately or effectively convey our gratitude. Today marks 1,481 days that have been filled with terror. One was the day my brother Charles was murdered. It took over 30 hours for the defendant to finally send a cold-hearted text to Charles' sons informing them that their father was dead. No phone call, no explanation as to how, when, and where. Colin Zach immediately called me hoping this was a cruel joke. Your Honor, I'm going to object as this, this has nothing to do with this case. It's overruled, Mr. Thomas. Stop objecting. Let him speak. Oh, my God. You can continue this, <laughs> this was the beginning of a, her cruel campaign of terror, a campaign that resulted in the deaths of J.J. and Tylee, two innocent children, and Tammy, a devoted mother, grandmother, and wife. Our intense fear for JJ's safety began the very moment we learned of Charles's death. We knew Lori didn't want JJ anymore as we had seen her abandon him for 72 days with little to no concern of his well-being. We now understand that this was so she could carry on her illicit and torrid affair with Chad Daybell and to conspire with him to murder and profit from my brother's death. With the number of divorces in Larry's past, it took me a while to understand why my brother had to die. I now realize what a nothing Chad Daybell is, mm. a man with no ability to support anyone, mm -hmm. no success of his own, mm -hmm. a user of the weak minded, a lazy, good for nothing, spineless man that rode his wife's coattails of success. True. After learning of Charles's death, I immediately began reaching out to Lori. I began calling, leaving voicemails and texting. Finally, after three long hours, I received a brief text with zero details. She couldn't be bothered or felt too guilty to pick up a phone and call this time his sister and explain what happened. It was, it set out so many alarms for Larry and I. Within minutes, we were on the phone with an Arizona detective learning the horrifying truths of my brother's murder. This all began with greed, the greed for and desire for a $1 million life insurance policy. She should have answered my calls. She should have spoken to me. I would have given her the money. 
She could have let JJ entirely live and had a million dollars. She could have been free to be Chad's mistress and foot the bill with the money from spilled blood. JJ and Tylee could have been with us living happy lives. <laughs> Instead, she took all that away, all because she is a money-hungry, power-mongering monster. We flew to Arizona the next morning and were finally able to meet with the detective shortly after. We learned the frightful details of my brother being ambushed by Lori and Alex. I know my brother and what we were hearing made no sense to the kind, gentle, and generous and loving man we knew him to be. After hearing the details, our immediate, immediate concern was JJ's safety. We had no legal rights to JJ. This simply left our hands tied. We were powerless then and have felt overwhelmingly powerless since. It is the most unwanted and terrible feeling to be in that position. I pray no one ever must deal with this type of circumstance. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I would say not even Lori or Chad, but their evil and malicious plans are why we are here. She has shown no grief for the lives she willingly took or the pain she caused. Today, I take the power back by standing here speaking out loud of all the pain and loss she caused. I pray that my words will assist you. My sincerest hope is that they will serious, be seriously contemplated in imposing a sentence for her cruel and heinous crimes. Yeah, During the trial, life. a lot of information was shared about JJ's death. Today, I want to share how he lived. That is truly the only way to understand and know who he was and the gaping hole his, his death has left in our hearts and in this world. Payne and Todd Trahan came into this world fighting on May 25th, 2012, 10 weeks premature and weighing in at a tiny but mighty two pounds and 14 ounces. He was transferred to a hospital with neonatal intensive care unit within minutes of being born where he spent weeks fighting to grow and live. I remember seeing him for the first time. My son, Todd, his biological father, and I had followed the ambulance to the hospital. He was about two hours old when we were finally able to see him. He was so tiny and looked so fragile. In fact, I still have one of his tiny preemie diapers. It fits in the palm of my hand. As soon as I laid my eyes on him, I knew he was my grandson. He was the tiniest version of my son, Todd, who was also seeing him for the first time. Todd, Todd struck with the love for him that can't be explained. The love that he had to new parents can't be put into words. I remember him later saying, how can I love someone I've never met this much? It is a feeling I and millions of others have experienced at the birth of a child. Lori, Todd forgives you. I wanted to make sure you know that. While he was in the NICU, Lord I was only able to see him for a few minutes at a time until I was notified he could be released to Larry and I in a few days. When we were initially asked if Kanan could come home with us, Larry and I didn't hesitate and immediately said yes, even though it had been 25 years since I had a new baby at home and never a preemie with their many medical needs. The only place we wanted him to be at home with us was at home with us. <clears throat> The night before he was discharged, I stayed in a little room next to the NICU, talking to the nurses and learning all the little things that our little pre preemie grandbaby would need. The next day, when it was time to leave, the nurse brought a wheelchair in and said, have a seat and I'll get you out of here. I looked at her and kind of perplexed. I don't need a wheelchair. I can walk. She gave me a smile and a little chuckle and then let me know it's hospital policy for discharged babies. So I sat in the wheelchair, took Kanan in my arms and was wheeled out of the hospital, just like a new mama. I felt so much pride for this little baby who had not only overcome being born 10 weeks early, but also being born with illicit substances in his tiny little body. He was healthy and ready to come home well before he was expected, and my pride in him knew no bounds. We knew then that he was a champion and oh so very special. That day began an amazing experience of raising our cherished little man. His first night home as I bathed him, he cried so hard, and I cried right along with him. My heart was so heavy with all that he had been through in just the few short weeks since his birth. After his bath and still crying, my husband, Larry, who JJ called Papa, asked me to hand Canaan to him. He placed our baby Cannon on his bare, ch Kanan on his bare chest and wrapped his robe around him, gently breathing on his head, rhythmically patted his back. Larry yeah, so um, the family tree is a little bit complicated because this is Kay Woodcock, her son, um, her son had a kid, but I don't remember why he was unable to take care. Maybe, I mean, they just brought up, maybe it's like, um, oh, what happened to my camera? <laughs> oh, it's okay. I don't even look at my camera. Um, I think like maybe there was drugs involved and she just said that like the baby did have drugs in their system. So maybe they were drug addicts or something. And so um, 
Her brother, who is Charles Vallow, he ended up adopting. He ended up adopting um, his nephew's kid. So that's why Charles is the dad and also at the same time, the uncle. Yeah, let me fix my camera. Give me a second. Harry kept patting and breathing warmth onto the top of his head until he finally relaxed, stopped crying and fell asleep. This became a daily occurrence, part of our routine. He would hold him for hours so that Canaan would feel loved, comforted and secure. I saw my husband in a new light. Larry jumped in feet first at 65 years old and did all the things a young and new father should and more. It made our relationship grow and gave us a new strength. Canaan was our strength and we were his comfort. His first six months were spent going to countless appointments. We went to appointments for, with doctors, heart, kidney, and urology problems, then to appointments for speech and occupational therapy, as well as visits to other pediatricians for a host of medical problems. We were always going from one appointment to another, constantly working to help him thrive and grow. That, along with loving him, was our number one priority. At each appointment, it became inevitable for me to cry. It deeply wounded me to see him go through so much, but I also felt immense pride in seeing him grow and how much love and happiness he gave to us and everyone that met him. My sister Susan had a special bond with Canaan and spent her days watching him so that I could work. She used to take him for walks, pushing the stroller endlessly. She could get him to belly laugh with silly animal noises, especially the froggy noise. There is no sweeter sound than a baby with an ecstatic belly laugh. Memories of the time watching Can spent watching Canaan grow, discovering his hands, toes, and feet are all Susan has left of that special bond and the immense grief of his loss is overwhelming. At six months old, he, the time came for the surgery he needed to repair a hernia. Charles and Lori flew to be with us at the Children's Hospital in New Orleans. This is a scary moment in time for us. Our tiny little man was undergoing surgery and their support meant so much to us. After his surgery, Lori insisted I take the sofa as she slept overnight on the floor of the hospital room. Later, the decision was made to let Charles and Lori adopt Canaan. I knew she would always be 1,000% involved, involved in his care, and I knew it would be okay since I witnessed that. She would always be there to help support and care for Canaan. That is part of why this is so hard. How does a woman that would go to that lane for a baby boy a few short years later brutally take his life? It is mind blowing and I will never understand it. Charles and Lloyd were granted custody a short time later. It was then Canaan became JJ. It was a happy and devastating at the same time. We loved every minute of raising him. We poured all our love energy into ensuring he grew and thrived. We knew our conditional, unconditional love and that, was, that time was priceless. Canaan's growth and milestones were clear evidence for our love for him. We knew the adoption was the best decision for his future to have energetic parents, siblings, and access to the types of schools and services we didn't have in Lake Charles, Louisiana. With his departure, we felt a grief that really can only be compared to the grief of losing someone to death, which is now a feeling we all know too well. We had barely made it 30 days before we were standing on Charles's front steps to love on our baby. When the door opened, there he was in his little baby walker, and I swear I saw tears in his eyes at seeing us. He had missed us too. Before I could take a step, Larry swooped him up in his arms, and at 11 months old, JJ wrapped his tiny arms around Larry laying his head on him. There it was, the connection, it was still so strong. We never lost that special connection with JJ. We were always in love, comfort, and safety. JJ's adoption was final in July of 2014, and Charles and Lori moved with the kids to Hawaii, living in a house that backed up to a closed golf course, and it was perfect for JJ. It was like having the biggest backyard ever, and it was heaven for him. He would go Aww. outside, and he would run, and run, and run, and run, and I ran and ran to chase him and catch up to him. Somewhere, somehow, he never, ever ran out of energy. JJ also had no fear, and everything was an adventure. He climbed on everything, and he could do it in the blink of an eye. We have pictures sent from Charles of JJ sitting on top of refrigerators and cabinets with a grin on his face. Listening to testimony during the trial and hearing the defendant claim to others that he turned into a demon for doing what he had always done devastates me. How dare she take his energy and adventurous nature and turn it into a reason to further her murderous conspiracy. We would visit Hawaii every four to five months and stay 10, 14 days. We needed to soak up as much JJ time as we could. Yeah, On one trip in the winter of 2015, JJ stayed home with me while Charles and Lori went to church. I was making a big pot of gumbo. I had to bring a little bit of Louisiana home cooking to Charles and JJ was excited to help me. 
we pulled up a stool. He poured ingredient after ingredient. I can still see him standing next to me, pouring chicken broth in the pot. Afterwards, he climbed on the counter and just watched, taking it all in. It is a memory that I will always cherish and dearly hold on to. During our visits with Charles or Lori, during our visits, Charles or Lori would comment on how JJ would do things with us that were in stark contrast for them. He always awoke at the crack of dawn, never sleeping any later. However, when we would visit, he would sleep, we would have him sleep with us. JJ would ask Paul Paul to pat his back, just like when he was a baby and fall asleep. He would sleep until nine or 10, which astonished them. There was never a doubt. He had an innate and unbroken attachment to us. Each visit, no matter where they lived, Lori always, always expressed her deep appreciation that we gave them the greatest gift ever in JJ. Lori loved to entertain and have family visit ours and hers. She invited family and friends to Hawaii and friends from Hawaii to Arizona. Zero is the number That same mother murdered that same child she expressed her deep appreciation for. It is mind boggling, and I don't think I will ever be able to understand it. Back to JJ, he was incredibly smart. He was reading at middle school level. By the time he was four, I remember being in a store with JJ and on the, the aisle with eye drops, and there he was reading off the labels Visine, Sustain, and a histamine, one long word after another. I hadn't seen him do that before, so you can imagine my surprise and delight. As we stood there, he would occasionally stumble on a syllable or pronunciation, but we took the time to go through the words and helped him learn. As he got a little older, his special education school in Arizona told Charles he was a math savant. He could calculate anything. I continually wonder what he would have become, what type of man would he be? What did Lori deprive the world of? JJ left school, loved his family, friends, and cousins, especially his cousin, Praxy. The two of them had such a special bond and love for each other. There are, many, there are so many lives he touched from family, teachers, neighbors, and church members that all feel the immense pain and loss of him being gone. Not only was JJ smart, but he was also funny, content, healthy, compassionate, and, and an empathetic child. JJ didn't show his empathy and compassion with hugs and kisses. Hey, Sherry. In fact, you had to chase him down for those. But instead, with his gentle touch and speaking in soft tones, he would constantly stop to ask people if they were okay, if he could see or sense they were hurt. His world was fascinating and exciting with his huge imagination. He would put on concerts for his stuffed animals under our enormous oak tree, playing the drums on buckets and pots and pans. The joy, the joy he exuded and shared cannot be measured. I loved watching him, taking him in and seeing how he approached the world. I never got enough of him. Now I've had all I would get for the rest of my life and I will only have the precious memories <clears throat> to cling to. Now memories are how I feel the love I so desperately miss due to the heinous acts of his mother, the deplorable woman that chose to be his mother, the woman that five years earlier made the conscious decision to stand in front of a judge and swore to provide for, care, love, and protect him. When Charles and Lloyd married, Damn, just five years before. When Charles and Lori married, Tylee was three years old. She was the most precious, blonde-haired, blue-eyed little girl. There was never any doubt that Tylee was an absolute mama's girl when she was little. She adored Lori. I was thrilled to have a, nie a new niece, especially one as sweet as her. While Charles and Lori lived in Austin, we visited frequently. On one of our visits, we passed a, a roadside stand selling swings made from old tires. Just remember, JJ was only seven years old when he was murdered. Seven years old. And it seems like five years before that's when Lori decided to take him in, um, if I have my timelines correct. Um, the son that was adopted by her second husband. No, so this is uh, Kay Woodcock, right? She is the sister of Charles Vallow. Charles Vallow was Lori Vallow's uh, fourth husband. So what happened was uh, Kay Woodcock had a son... And they had a kid, but the reason why her son didn't keep the kid is because it seems like they had like substance abuse um, issues. So what happened was instead her brother, Charles Vallow adopted his nephew. So yeah, it's like, I think we had a family tree. Um, there should be a family tree on my YouTube channel. If you look it up, like Lori Vallow family tree, because it, there, there are a lot of family members are involved and it gets a little bit confusing sometimes. Is this a scuba tank? <laughs> no. I saw one that had been made into a horse complete with a saddle and stirrups. I grabbed Larry's arms Looks and like stopped. One. We have to get that for Tylee. Her brother, Colby, and stepbrothers, Cole and Zach, were always around her, and she needed something girly just for her, and she loved it. As a big sister, Tylee would put notes on her bedroom door, one of them being, do not enter. 
And as you can assume, even though JJ could read and understand the notes, it didn't mean he listened. After mm -hmm. all, isn't that what little brothers do? He would storm into her room and she would laughingly tell him to get out. I think she did it on purpose just to tease and play with him. It was hilarious to see them interact and warmed our hearts seeing them together. Tylee was nine years old when JJ became her little brother. She loved him so incredibly much and he loved her right back. She doted on him and JJ, loved every minute of attention he got from his big sister. The love they have for each other is captured in the last photo taken of them, both grinning and hugging each other. Hauntingly, this photo was taken shortly before and by the defendant hours before she murdered her own child, her sweet girl, Tylee. Wow, she just shook her head. Is she still denying it? Lori, are you still denying this? She just shook her head. So there are times where I do see her laughing. There are times where I see her pick up a tissue and dab her eye a little bit. And that's usually when they talk about her children. So I do wonder if like, you know, she she is sad when they bring up the children. But maybe she's like in such denial that like what she did wasn't wrong. And by the defendant, hours before she murdered her own child, her sweet girl, Tylee. Mm. Shaking her head. I have a niece that is a few months younger than JJ. Her name is Maddie. She and JJ loved each other and would spend days playing together when Charles and JJ would visit. On her eighth birthday in October of 2020, we were celebrating and singing happy birthday to her. The glow of the candles shining on her face, that huge grin that kids get during the singing hit me like a truck. I grabbed the keys from Larry and ran to the car and I just bawled and bawled un until I could compose myself enough to rejoin the party. I knew then that JJ didn't get his eighth birthday song and it, it broke me. No, this is no demon possession. This is just her being fucking evil. That is man. how many days it has been since I've seen JJ. And She's how many responsible days for it, not a demon. To see that Sorry. it's been since I've seen JJ. And how many days since I was able to see that same candlelight growing, blowing grin and for being sung happy birthday. You see, the last time I was able to hug and kiss JJ was in May of 2019 when we celebrated his seventh birthday. It is just so wrong. He didn't get to have that joy and feeling of love of another birthday because Aww, his mother is greedy and so his young. life was expendable to her. <clears throat> we never know when one of those moments are going to hit, but I can tell you that there have been too many situations in the past few years where we get slammed with the fact that JJ won't hit another milestone in his life. All because his materialistic, self-centered mother cruelly and brutally stole his life <clears throat> and him from the world. Lori's acts of depravity, cruelty, and betrayal have no limits. She murdered and stole JJ's daddy from him on July 11th, 2019. Next, she was trying to sell Bailey, JJ's adored and cherished service dog, his shadow and his best friend. When caught, she was confronted and forced to give Bailey back to his original trainer. I can't imagine how that impacted JJ. Bailey went everywhere with him and provided him so much security and happiness. 52. That's how many days after Charles's death, she waited, continuing her trail of destruction. So I think there, Bailey was uh, JJ's service dog and was a dog that loved JJ and vice versa. And like, she just gave the dog away. But luckily they were able to track the dog down, I think, and uh, give it to a better home or something. I, I by taking really JJ comments. away from his home, his family, his school, his sense of well-being and normalcy by moving to Rexburg. JJ and Tylee were isolated and deprived of everything and everyone they knew and loved. Eight, that's how many days later until another act of treachery with the murder and desecration of Tylee. The immense sorrow I feel in thinking of JJ's last days and week cannot be measured. How did he cope with the shockwave of change, confusion and chaos being autistic and just a child in general, he thrived and excelled with his routines and schedules and nothing was routine at that point. How much grief and fear did he experience? The loss of his dad, his world was upside down. During those two months, I continually asked to the point of pleading with Lori to let us visit JJ. She only agreed once and then canceled the trip was for JJ to attend Charles's memorial services back home in Louisiana. Our FaceTime talk calls, something that had been the norm, were cut shorter and shorter until our last call. On August 10th of 2019, it lasted for 35 seconds. This is all started, this all started with her greed. Her greed for a $1 million life insurance policy and her lust for Chad. 72 days, that is how many days it took Lori to take everything from JJ. He lost his dad, his home, his best friend Bailey, his beloved big sister, and his life, all in 72 days. 
My sister said it best. My sister Susan said it best. She killed him slowly by taking away everything that mattered. The following nine months were pure hell. Nothing else can describe the feeling of not knowing where the children were. We were continually learning more about the evil that the defendant was involved with, and our fears continued to mount daily. That's 319. So That's how many days from the last time we were able to FaceTime with JJ until the moment we learned the children had been found in Chad Daybill's backyard, buried like animals. When the call came home, when the call came, a sound escaped me that only can be described as guttural. Our worst fear, fears were confirmed and we were destroyed. The grief my family and I have endured is immeasurable. Lori cruelly took my big brother, Charles, <clears throat> my adorable grandson, JJ, and my beautiful niece, Tylee, and sweet Tammy, whose family I've come to know and love. Laura sitting next to the devil. Laura is undeniably a monster, a monster that has taken away, <laughs> taken any, has not taken any responsibility or shown an ounce of remorse for her vile actions. She deserves to never again breathe oxygen as a free member of society. Her actions, dismissive behavior, and disinterest in court proceedings continue to validate her lack of accountability and remorse or any possibility to be rehabilitated. Lori Cox Daybell is a danger to society. Her body and manipulative mind are weapons used for her selfish greed and satisfaction. We firmly believe that she has zero uh, mental sorry, illness. Your Honor, I'm going to have to object. I think the court ruled on this particular portion <laughs> of her on. statement. I'm going to ask that the court enforce that. <clears throat> Give me a moment. Let me review the Very good, of the written PSI in the court's previous order. And the court struck from the statement, so you can continue. <clears throat> Ms. Woodcock. <clears throat> We firmly believe that she has zero mental illness that drove her to commit these heinous acts. Rather, she is driven by her greed and need to be the center of attention. I'm During sorry, the trial, a jail call was job, played between Lori and her son, Colby, as she continued her manipulation. Today, it feels especially poignant. Quoting Lori, they have made all these judgments. They think they know what happened. They think they know who's responsible. They think they know everything, but you don't know because you weren't there. And one day you will know, one day you will know it, what, ha what actually happened. Those are her words. It is the, the one truth that Lori has told since the beginning of her campaign of terror. We do know what exact actually happened and who is responsible, Lori. Mm -hmm. Today is the day that she will finally be punished for her manipulation, cruelty, and criminal acts. She has shown no remorse for the murders, the lying, the deceit, or the pain. During the trial, we heard Lori deflect and minimize her sister's grief. Mm -hmm. We heard her exclaim that she was trying to go on with life, that she needed to be happy. All while she was dancing on the beach and her children were buried in Chad's backyard. Only someone with no remorse tries to justify the cold-blooded murder of her children with her needs. We wholeheartedly believe she was not only complicit, but was an active participant in both JJ and Tylee's murders making her crimes even more reprehensible. Your Honor, my family and I pray for nothing. Okay. We you trust your wisdom in, in determining the sentence for the fraud. Uh, sorry about that too. Strike that. Mm -hmm. um, you got this. You can do it. Okay. It's hard. Um, we believe there should never be a reason for her to be released from prison. She deprived JJ, Tylee, and Tammy of that right and should never be given what she so easily took from them. I'll leave with two final numbers. Three for the three people who were murdered, who, will never for, who we will never forget. And finally, the number one for the defendant, the person that will never matter again once we walk out the door. All right, Ms. Woodcock, thank you for the victim impact statement. Aww. Mr. Wood, are there any other statements to be offered into the record? Yes, Your Honor. Um, I will. We've been asked to read Colby Ryan's statement into the record, and so I'll do that now. Very well. Colby Ryan's her eldest son. As the older brother to Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, and the son of Charles Vallow, I want to say the generations have been affected by these murders. My children will never know their uncle, their aunt, or grandfather, or even their own grandmother. Tylee and J.J. brought so much light into this world. With their lives being stolen, I would like to share this. I believe that nothing could or will ever be the same. Tylee will never have an opportunity to become a mother, wife, or have the career she was destined to have. She will never be able to have the life she deserved. JJ will never be able to grow and spread his light with this world the way he did. He will never have a chance to grow up. My girls will never have a chance to know them in this life. My siblings and father deserve so much more than this. 
I want them to be remembered for who they were and not to be just a spectacle or a headline to the world. Tylee was sweet and kind, funny and bold, and she deserves to be seen as such. JJ was the most fun, sweet, and silly kid I'd ever known, loving and so smart. He deserves to be seen as such. Charles was a loving, kind, and generous father, and he did everything he could to help and provide for everyone around him. He deserves to be seen as that. This has affected me personally more than I could ever possibly put into words. I've lost my entire family in life. I lost the opportunity to share life with the people I love the most. I've watched everything crumble and be shredded to pieces. I have lost my sister, brother, father, and my mother. I've lost cousins and family, friends, and everything in between. These murders have changed everyone's life who loved these beautiful people, but I still know that God is above holding them in his arms and will provide a life after this to reunite. I pray for healing for everyone involved, including those who took the lives of all the ones we love. Thank you. All right, the court's considered that statement as well at this point then. Mr. Wood, are there any other victim impact statements to read into the record? No. Very well. At this time then, as I mentioned, I'll move forward and have the state make its sentencing recommendations. After that, then the defense may make their recommendations. So, Mr. Wood, you can commence with the state's sentencing recommendation. Colby was great in the documentary. Which one? Your Honor, I want to start with the question. What is the value of a human life? What is the value of the life of a 16-year-old girl with her life ahead of her? What is the value of a life of a seven-year-old boy with special needs? What is the value of the life of a mother and a grandmother? No matter how we look at what we are doing here today, we are calculating and assigning a value for the lives of Tylee Ryan, J.J. Valero, and Tammy Daybell. The defendant, now a convicted murderer, by her heinous and egregious acts, has assigned a value of zero to each of these lives. The sentence imposed by the court today will represent the value that our community through our court places on the lives of these three victims. To the people of Idaho, this day should be more about the victims than the defendant. This court has multiple factors it must consider today, including the sentencing factors found in Idaho Code 19-2521. Justice requires the court to view all of the factors it will consider through the lives or through the lens of the value of the lives of Tyree, JJ, and Tammy. We echo the sentiments made by the victims uh, or in the victim impact statements. And we just briefly uh, speak about these immediate victims. Tylee Ryan was born on September 24th of 2002. She was murdered between September 8th and 9th of 2019. People who knew her called her witty, charming, intelligent. She'd received her GED in order to graduate early. We know she often cared for her brother. In evidence, we, in evidence, we had videos of her with him and she would call him my JJ. She loved Hawaii. She loved the beach. She had friends and family who loved her very much on both her father and her mother's side. Her father was Joseph Ryan, who predeceased her in 2018. Her older brother is Colby Ryan, with whom she shared a special bond. After Joseph Ryan died, Tylee, as this court knows, was the recipient of uh, Social Security benefits. And she actually shared a lot of those with her brother, Colby because that's the type of person she was. In serving search warrants, we accessed her Instagram account where we learned that she was intensely loyal to her own mother. From her finances, we know she was a typical teenager. She liked to have fun. She was also independent and responsible. JJ Vallow was born May 25th of 2012 and he was murdered between September 22nd and 23rd of 2019. As we heard earlier, he was initially born as Kane and Todd Trahan in less than ideal circumstances and was initially raised by his grandparents. He was then adopted by the defendant and her husband, Charles Vallow. He was loved by his family and friends. He loved to travel. Tammy Daybell was born May 4th, 1970, and she was murdered on October 19th, 2019. She was a mother of five children and she's now a grandmother. She was a school librarian and educator we know from her phone and from witnesses, she loved her children intensely. She was physically active and she was kind. This court laid out the procedural history of the case. I'm just gonna briefly touch on, a, on some, some dates that are important to the state and we think are important in terms of sentencing. The defendant met Chad Daybell in October of 2018 and within a year, her husband Charles Vallow was dead. 
Mm. Her children was dead. Her mm-hmm. Children were dead, and her boyfriend's wife was dead. Mm-hmm. In late August, early September 2019, the defendant moved to Rexburg with Tylee and JJ and her co-conspirator and brother Alex Cox. Tylee was last seen on September 8th, 2019, and JJ was last seen September 22nd. It's not even a long time to even know someone. One year. Tammy Daybell was last seen on October 19th. On November 5th, barely more than two weeks after Tammy was murdered, this defendant married her co-conspirator, Chad Daybell. November of 2019, Rexburg police were contacted regarding a Jeep that was involved in a shooting in Maricopa County, Arizona. Later that month, J.J. Vallow was reported missing, and an investigation was furthered into Tammy's death, and law enforcement became aware that Tylee was missing. On December 12th, Tammy Daybell was exhumed. The next day, Alex Cox, one of the defendant's co-conspirators, died in, Mar- in Arizona. At the end of that December, the search for the children became public, and there was no response from the defendant or her co-conspirator. In January of 2020, and the defendant was served in Hawaii. to produce children, and there was no response. Charges were filed for abandonment of minor children. And I want to be clear, the defendant had a right to silence. She did not have a right to disobey the order of the court to to produce the bodies of her children. Chad's trial, uh, June 2024. The Rexburg Police, the Fremont County Sheriff's Department, the FBI, and the Idaho Attorney General's Office devoted thousands of hours of work into looking for Tylee and JJ and to investigating the death of Tammy Daybell. She playing with her hair? On June 9th, 2020, Tylee and JJ were found in the defendant's husband's backyard. On May 24th of 2021, the defendant was indicted by a grand jury for the crimes of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder of Tylee Ryan and grand theft by deception, the murder of Tylee Ryan, the conspiracy to commit murder, first-degree murder of J.J. Vallow and grand theft by deception, the murder of J.J. Vallow, the conspiracy to commit murder of Tammy Daybell and grand theft. And the defendant was convicted by a jury of her peers in Ada County on all counts on May 12th of this year. This court is required to uh, consider the factors in Idaho Code 19-2521 subparent A in sentencing. And that particular statute reads, the goals of sentencing include the primary consideration of the protection of society, followed by the possibility of risk reduction through rehabilitation, deterrence of the individual and the public generally, and punishment or retribution for wrongdoing, and the impact on the victim. I want to talk about protection of society. This defendant has proven by her actions that she is dangerous to society. In Idaho alone, she yep, was involved in three murders in the space of six weeks. While she's not convicted yet, I think the court can acknowledge that she faces two charges of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder in Maricopa County. Two of the murders in Idaho were her own children. This defendant violated the most sacred trust that exists in society that between a mother and her children. And she did it for gain. She did it for money. A defendant who is willing to murder her own children is willing to murder anyone. Society can only be protected from this defendant by a life sentence without the chance of parole. There is no indication that upon murdering for financial gain that she feels any remorse. The amount of murders in her ledger show us that she will seek to obtain money through murder again if released. And again, only a sentence of life without parole will satisfy the court's mandate to protect society. Courts required to consider risk reduction through rehabilitation. And it's tempting to just say, there's no rehabilitation possible. What is rehabilitation? It's the process of restoring a person to normal and a constructive place in society. (laughs) She does not deserve that. Some crimes render a criminal unable to fully be rehabilitated as a function of member, functioning member of society, some crimes are so heinous that you simply lose your place among the rest of us. Killing your own children and your boyfriend's wife are these types of crimes. Rehabilitation requires remorse and acceptance of responsibility. Mm-hmm. And there is literally zero evidence yep. that this defendant feels remorse or responsibility yep. for her crimes. Uh, the court heard victims talk about her behavior at trial. And I think that was an indicator that she lacks remorse, that she lacks accountability. The only way to rehabilitate this this at any level is to make her face the consequences of her heinous crimes that she has committed, and that is only possible through a sentence of life in prison without any chance chance of release. This court is required to consider deterrence of the individual and the public. 
Again, deterrence requires accountability. She has none. One thing that has been so shocking about these crimes is where it happened. Fremont and Madison County, Idaho. These are fairly rural areas. These are low crime areas. And I would note that this defendant, despite being labeled oftentimes by the media as a Rexburg, Idaho mother, is not a Rexburg, Idaho mother. She's not from Rexburg. She actually spent very little time here before she was arrested. Idaho does and have our death sentence, was left but by these crimes. she's not going to get it. The sentence that the court imposes today will be a message. And these, the citizens of these two counties have a right to the message, don't come here and commit these crimes. Hey, Ken. The citizens of these counties don't live these type of lives. And we don't want people to come here and commit these crimes. And this court has a responsibility to send that message, to give a sentence that gives that deterrence. It's the state's position that only a sentence of life without parole will send the proper message of deterrence both to this defendant and the public. And in, in, the, in line with deterrence, if, if these crimes don't merit that type of sentence, the state's unaware of what kind of crimes would. Finally, the court is required to consider punishment and retribution and the impact on the victim. The obvious impact of the defendant's crimes against Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, and Tammy Daybell was death. And we can't ask Tylee, J.J., and Tammy about that experience because they're gone. They don't have a voice. We can't ask them what it felt like to be murdered. We can't ask them about the impact of their last moments. And murdered by we have to instead family look at the members. Evidence and glean what we can regarding the impact of the murder of Tylee, J.J., and Tammy. This court sat through a trial. And a piece of shit uncle of theirs. This court uh, saw the same evidence that the state saw, that the defendant saw, that the jury saw. This court was the custodian of that. And so this court has seen how horrific these crimes were. And I want to talk individually about the impact of these crimes on these, on these victims. So what was the impact on Tylee? Hey, Kat. We don't even know how she died. And why is that? because her body was mutilated, it was dismembered, and it was burnt beyond recognition. We only know for a surety that it was her because of DNA testing. Mm. Her body, body was utterly destroyed, and she was buried in a pet cemetery next to animals. And she had some strange her skull was literally separated bone from her injuries. Body and was destroyed in such a manner, that we couldn't even tell 100% from dental records if it was her. The defendants put her body in a green bucket that melted from the heat of her burning flesh and put it on top of her skull in a pet cemetery. The impact of this crime on this victim was horrendous. We know she had puncture wounds in her pelvis, and we know from the testimony of Dr. Christensen at trial that those puncture wounds were received at or near the time of death, and they were consistent with stabbing, but not consistent with dismemberment. Again, the impact of the murder of Tylee was horrendous. And this impact will continue. Tylee will never get to become a mother, as we heard earlier. She will never get have the opportunity to go to college. She won't get to choose a career to satisfy her curiosity or make any of the other decisions that young adults get to make for themselves. She won't get to travel the world. She won't get to marry. She won't get to be there for her brother Colby or her brother JJ. She won't get to spend time with her other family members. The impact of murder never ends. So this defendant's sentence must last equally as long. I want to talk about the impact on J.J. Vallow. Again, we can't speak to him, but we've seen the evidence. He was only seven. We know that he died from asphyxiation from duct tape and a plastic bag wrapped around his head. The evidence showed that there was a struggle. And what was the impact on that little... And I don't understand why why give these kids such painful like horrible dads what's uh, when you when you when you mercy kill an animal what do you do use a gun right like why why give them such painful fucking deaths and didn't they know that there were weren't they guns on the property i i just don't understand I, they really just did not give a fuck like just did not care boy's mind as he fought for his life. His last moments must have been filled with fear and betrayal. 
And what is the impact of being buried like a piece of trash rather than receiving a proper burial? This defendant and her co-conspirators showed a callous disregard for human life by the demeaning way they treated his and his sister's bodies. Similar to Tylee, JJ will never get to grow up. He will never be able to reach his potential. He won't spend time with family, friends, and loved ones. What was the impact on Tammy Daybell? This defendant was not charged with the actual murder of Tammy Daybell, but she was charged with the conspiracy to murder her and convicted of such charge. I would note conspiracy is not a lesser included of murder. It is an equal charge. We know that because the sentencing by statute is equal. It is equally as bad to conspire to murder as it is to murder. It's bad enough to steal someone else's spouse. But this crime rose to a whole other level of egregiousness because this defendant planned with her boyfriend the death of his wife. And when her brother and boyfriend committed that actual murder, she was vacationing on a beach in Hawaii. But as asphyxiation? We don't know or sacrifice? Exactly what Tammy's last moments were like. We can't ask her. We know she had bruising on her body that appeared to be at or near the time of death. Like Tylee, like JJ, the impact on this victim continues. She won't get to spend time with her children. She can't give them advice. She can't be there for her grandchildren, her brothers, and her sister. She missed her mother's funeral. But the impact doesn't end with the individual and immediate victims. It spreads. It's the proverbial rock thrown in the lake that ripples and ripples and ripples. Murder tears at the fabric of society more than any other crime. Infanticide defies the law of nature. Mothers are meant to care for their children. When we consider the impact of the victim, it's appropriate for this court to consider the impact on the living victims as well. So when we talk about punishment, it has to match the crime. Not only do we need to protect society, do what we can to rehabilitate and deter, the punishment has to match the crime. Punishment must be, because this was the ultimate crime, killing your own children, killing your boyfriend's wife, the punishment must be the ultimate allowed by the law. And at this time, that is life sentences without parole. In such a heinous way, no regrets. Harsh. We're asking that because it's the right thing to do. No set of contrition. It's the only punishment that matches what this defendant did. I want to just briefly address some of the material found in the PSI. Uh, there are two mental health reports, one by Dr. Watson and one by Dr. Cunningham. Cunningham, excuse me. And so what's in them? They say that this defendant suffers from a delusional disorder. She has grandiose and persecutory features, which I would note is something that many serious criminals have. It says she has hyper-religiosity with bizarre beliefs. More important though than what's in those reports, I wanna talk about what's not in them. These are bare bones reports with barely, thing any, with barely anything more than alleged diagnosis. There's no analysis of her behavior. And that's important to know because psychologically we can tell more from what a person does than what they say. There's zero evidence provided or in those reports that the defendant's alleged mental illness contributed to her crimes. There's zero evidence in those reports that the defendant's alleged mental illness hindered her ability to know right from wrong. And in fact, the evidence is overwhelming that she did know right from wrong. She lied to the police, she lied to family members, and she lied to friends regarding the children of Tammy. Even their close Hi, friends who they shared some of these religious beliefs with, they lied to about the death of the children. And what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that Tylee and JJ didn't die because their mom thought they were upset, possessed. If she truly believed that, she would have preached it because she preached all the time. Mm. She didn't tell anyone that because she knew why she killed them. Listen, I think, I think these three idiots, I'm saying three because it's her, her brother, and then uh, fucking Chad as well. I think the three of them just, well, especially the two of them, Lori and Chad, I think they wanted to get rid of the kids. They want to get the money, but they're too much of a coward to be like, hey, let's get rid of their kids and just like, let's collect the money. They like had to like kind of like interweave it in like a, whatever religious beliefs that they had at the time and then convince her brother to participate in it. Instead of just being like, hey, can you kill the kids? Because we want to collect the money and we want to be free of them. It's just like, oh, let's start talking about demons. Let's talk about zombies. Oh, man, these, these people, they got dark spirits. I don't know. How was JJ's behavior today? Oh, he was curious and he was running around. Oh, okay, that's like demon behavior. Like, I think they were just too much of a coward to say it directly to each other. And they were just like, using this whole thing is just like a bullshit excuse.
to get rid of them. She killed them for money. She's fixing her split ends. I don't know what the hell her she's doing. She looks like she was messing with her hair earlier. Not a pattern of grieving. She goes on vacation to Hawaii. She gets married. Yeah, in those reports, fucks. there's zero evidence provided of the defendant's mental state at the time of the crime. And again, all evidence shows that she was highly functioning at the time these crimes were committed. Just like with the um, the fucking adultery, right? It's like they are too much of a coward to admit that, like, hey, we're cheating our significant others and we're fucking each other. Instead, they're like, you know, oh, you know, in our past lives, Lori, you and I, we used to be together and then making up a bunch of other bullshit stories and stuff like that just to justify their actions. Like these people are just fucking cowards. There's no evidence that she wasn't able to provide for her food, clothing, shelter, transportation. Again, she arranged a marriage. She arranged living in Hawaii. They just made a bullshit to justify their actions. And further in these reports, there's no prognosis other than there is one prognosis that states the defendant will make a positive adjustment to prison. Well, that's good because that's where she belongs and that's where she needs to go. Other than that, there's no treatment suggestions or discussion of possible treatment. Again, we'd ask this court to look at the defendant's behavior more than anything she says. At trial, the defense made it clear that they see Chad Daybell as the primary antagonist and that he should be blamed for these crimes and not the defendant. That was in the closing. I want to be very clear. This court is precluded today from even engaging in any analysis of that. Chad Daybell's guilt has not been determined yet, and this court cannot engage in some type of balancing analysis of guilt when he must be presumed innocent by this court until proven guilty. Upon being proven guilty, we can have that conversation, but not now. And further, even if he had been determined guilty, this defendant was charged with conspiracy. This is not a comparative fault case. On a conspiracy, if you're in for a penny, you're in for a dollar. And there's an important societal uh, reason. There's an important reason that society has done that. It's bad enough when a person decides to commit a crime, especially one that includes victims. When a person teams up with another person and they agree to commit crimes, they become infinitely more dangerous. And so there is no comparative guilt. There is no comparative liability. This defendant has been found guilty by a jury, and that's all the court can consider in that regards. I would note that this case is a perfect example of why we punish conspiracy the way we do, because of the damage that arose from these agreements to murder. So, Your Honor, for the sentence that the state recommends. Life. life before I, before life. I state that, I, I ask this court to remember the victims. And what does justice for Tylee, JJ, and Tammy require? I note that the PSI made a recommendation, and it states, on January 3rd, 2023, the defendant's attorney filed a motion indicating they did not intend to raise a mental health defense. However, if she was convicted, they plan to submit information in support of mitigation during sentencing. It seems important to note that while she has been diagnosed with a mental illness, she had the mental capacity to fabricate a story regarding the whereabouts of her children, change Tylee's social security payments to her own account, oh plan God. a wedding to Mr. Daybell in Hawaii, attend a family vacation with Mr. Daybell's family, lie to them about not having minor children, and relocate to Hawaii. She did all this with the knowledge her children's bodies were buried on Mr. Daybell's property. Mm. Those closest to the defendant describe her as a loving and devoted mother. They indicate both children loved her very much. A mother is meant to protect her children. However, the defendant has been found guilty of the brutal murder of her children. The focus should be that three innocent people, Tylee, JJ, and Mrs. Daybell, were murdered. The sheer devastation of all the lives impacted by her abhorrent actions warrants punishment. Therefore, it is recommended she be sentenced to a period of incarceration under the custody of the Idaho State Board of Correction. As this court is aware, uh, PSI writers don't give specific recommendations for what time uh, an individual should spend in prison, but the state does have that. This court is aware that the state's position has always been that justice requires this defendant face the highest level of punishment for her crimes, which at this point is a life without parole sentence. The heinous nature of her crimes and the aftermath of those crimes show an utter and callous disregard for human life. She committed these crimes for remuneration and financial gain, and she has shown no remorse or accountability, and she sees herself as being above the law. She has shown contempt for these proceedings and the process of justice for her children and for Tammy Daybell. At this time, the ultimate, again, the ultimate punishment is fixed life sentences without the chance of parole. And so specifically, for count one, for the conspiracy to murder Tylee Ryan and commit grand theft, the state asks and request a sentence of fixed life without the chance of parole. 
For count two, the murder of Tylee Ryan, the state requests a sentence of fixed life without the chance of parole to run concurrent with the fixed life sentence for count one. For count three, the conspiracy to murder J.J. Vallow and to commit grand theft by deception, the state requests a sentence of fixed life without the chance of parole to run consecutive to the fixed life sentences for counts one and two. Consecutive sentences are justified here by the severity of the crimes, the fact that it involves different victims, and there was an appreciable amount of time between the murders of Tylee and J.J. For count four, the murder of J.J. Vallow, the state asked for a sentence of fixed life without the chance of parole to run concurrent with the fixed life sentence for count three, but consecutive to the fixed life sentences for counts one and two. For count five, the conspiracy to murder Tammy Daybell, the state requests a sentence of fixed life without the chance of parole to run consecutive to the fixed life sentences previously requested. And for count seven grand theft, the state requests the full sentence of 20 years. Pursuant to Idaho Code 195307, we, re we request a fine of $5,000 to be paid to the next of kin of Tylee and JJ. I would note that 19, Idaho Code 19-5307 includes a list of crimes, violent crimes, for which that payment to a victim may be uh, granted. And it includes murder, but does not include conspiracy to commit murder. However, we'd also note the, the lawyer? that under Idaho Code, the punishment for murder is the same as the punishment, or I'm sorry, the punishment for conspiracy is the same for the punishment to commit murder. And so we'd ask for a $5,000 fine to be paid to the next of kin of Tammy Daybell. We'd ask for an order of restitution to the United States of America Treasury in the amount of $22,545, which amount was proven at trial to be the amount that was stolen from the Department of Treasury. I would note, Your Honor, compared to these other crimes, a grand theft does not seem like a big deal. But oh, I, I don't know anything about this lawyer. That in context of these crimes, this grand theft is a big deal. It shows her contempt, not only for her children, shows her contempt for everybody else because that money belongs to everyone. Finally, pursuant to Idaho Code 18-112, we would ask for fines of $50,000 for each count of conspiracy and murder for a total of $250,000. Yeah, he's fines. with the state. The state has essentially asked for the maximum sentence allowed under the law. The sentence is not only justified, it is necessary to satisfy the four goals of sentencing in Idaho. A sentence less than what the state has requested will not satisfy those goals. Uh, he did read uh, the son's statement, Kobe Ryan's. Uh, that was probably about like, maybe like 30 minutes ago. And I want to end 20, where minutes I began. Ago? What is the value of a life? What is the value of Tylee Ryan's life? What is the value of J.J. Vallow's life? And what is the value of Tammy Daybell's life? Our communities and the people we represent, the value is great, it is immense, and it is immeasurable. No sentence given today will bring those victims back to their loved ones. Oh. There is no true justice for murder. <laughs> I've heard so we have to do the best we can. And any sentence that would allow this defendant to even hope for release from prison would send a message that these communities don't value the victims' lives appropriately. Again, in regarding the goals of sentencing, we, we request this court make its decision Pursuant to those goals and through the lens of what justice had the wrong label, but anyway, fortune. JJ mm -hmm. and Tammy. These crimes were heinous. They were egregious. Again, she murdered her own children. They had a right to depend on her. Tylee and JJ had a right to be protected by her. She betrayed their trust in the most awful and horrific way imaginable. She profited from those murders. The defendant conspired to murder her boyfriend's wife. Hey, Tim. It wasn't enough to steal or to break the marriage. She wanted Tammy dead. And why? Well, there were $430,000 that they profited from from that. And so what does justice for Tylee, JJ, and Tammy require? It requires this defendant never have a chance for freedom because her victims no longer have that. This defendant forfeit the remainder of her life to prison because her victims were forced to forfeit their lives. What is the value of a life? Thank you. The only thing Lori cared about was the dollar signs. What was the phrase I kept using the text message again? To unburden yourself. All right, Mr. Wood, there was just one point of clarification I wanted to have on the grand theft recommendation. Uh, you recommended a 
20 year sentence on that. And I just wanted to clarify, I believe the maximum possible under Idaho's grand theft statute is 14 years. That's correct, Your Honor. I apologize. It is 14 years. We would ask for the maximum 14 years. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Okay, Mr. Wood. All right. Where is oh, everyone? At what time is yes. it at your place? Uh, we'd like to double check that. I think it might have changed. Are they double checking it? I'll, I'll double check, counsel. I'm going to take a mid morning break at this point. We do have a court reporter that has to take down all of this verbatim, which is a large task, and others may need to use the restroom. Uh, I'll note that given all of the people here, the uh, right, guys, facilities we have, quick break. It, it will take some time. So we'll plan on a 30 minute recess and then I'll have the defense if they're ready to make their recommendations after the recess. Uh, Is that all right, Mr. Thomas? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, we'll take our recess then and we'll continue with the recommendations of the defense. Kansas? The You're in PH? Uh, what's PH? PH, PH, PH. Philippines. Let me just indicate, we'll have the audience and those in the gallery please wait while we have the defendant escorted out for security purposes. <laughs> She really do look like a Dr. Seuss character. <laughs> Once the, the bailiffs have given you the word that it's okay to exit the courtroom, you I can do can. that, but please remain where you are until that. Oh my God. There goes the Lorax. It's like, I don't know what the Lorax looked like. Look like a Dr. Seuss character escort. over here. And let me just indicate, we'll have the audience and those in the gallery please wait while we have the defendant <laughs> escorted out for security purposes. Once the bailiffs have given you the word that it's okay to exit the courtroom, you can do that, but please remain where you are until that. I thought she was wearing a onesie because the slippers kind of goes with the stripes in her outfit. Mm. Is it mean to wish for someone to just like hack her hair off and fucking... Jail. <laughs> Fuck Lori. 